if you think you felt a great disturbance in the force, you're not wrong. Ed Gross and me, Mark A. Altman, have a new oral history coming out this July from St. Martin's Press. It's Secrets of the Force, the complete, uncensored, unauthorized oral history of the Star Wars saga. So wherever you buy books, audio and video, pick it up today, pre-order, and you can learn the secrets of the Force. And don't miss our oral history of Star Trek in stores now. And of course, nobody does it better. The complete oral history of James Bond in digital, hardcover, paperback, and audio. That is all. If you're a fan of the 430 movie, you'll love Best Movies Never Made, hosted by myself, Josh Miller. And Steven Scarlatta. Where we explore some of the greatest movies never made, like E.T. 2. Johnny Quest. Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian. And Halloween 3D. New episodes available every other Monday, wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're a fan of Inglorious Trexperts, you're going to love Trexperts Briefing Room. A new series. Trexperts Briefing Room? What is that? I was about to explain, then you interrupted me. I'm sorry. It's curated audio commentaries of classic Star Trek episodes. From the original series, all the way through Enterprise. You're going to love it as we explore the the behind-the-scenes making of all these wonderful Star Trek episodes with cast and crew that you would never expect to hear doing audio commentaries on Star Trek. Sounds like fun. It will be. And you can <laughs> find it on the Inglorious Trexperts podcast feed and on the new Trexperts briefing podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. Let's go see what's out there. Hey, this is Mark A. Altman, and this is the 430 Movie Special Report. Rest in peace, Arclight Cinemas. When the Dome opened, it was advertised as the only theater of its kind in the world, and 49 years later, it still is. It's one of two commercial theaters in the world that can play Cinerama in its original three-strip process. It's been the home of many, many world premieres. Going back to the very beginning, the first film, Cinerama Picture, It's a Mad, Mad World, opened here November 7th, 1963. That's the day that the theater opened. The main reason that people are coming to Arclight is to see a specific picture. And it is our goal to make that presentation absolutely seamless distraction free and that's what we work for well i'm here with your back for the fourth season with your favorite 430 movie host but it's a very solemn occasion uh we're here to talk about the end of the arc light but more than just the arc light especially the cinerama dome so uh, uh, once again I, I i i will remind you since it's the beginning of an all-new season uh i have with us you know him as the uh mary stephen melchin uh, he's a writer-producer for television. His shows include X-Men the Animated Series, Dota Dragon's Blood, and, of course, Star Wars Rebels and the Clone Wars. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. And as as Roger Ebert would say, the balcony is closed. Mm, well, well, we'll get to that. But first, I want to introduce you to the terrific Tuesday, which has suddenly become a terrible Tuesday. <laughs> it's uh, You know him as a uh, conceptual artist for such uh, movies as X-Men, uh, three, the last stand. No, nope, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> He's the visual effects supervisor on the uh, Robert Wise uh, uh, Star Trek: The Motion Picture Director's Edition. Uh, movies like Real Steel um, and The Riddick <laughs> and uh, Master and Commander. That's a better one. There you go. Okay. Well, and last but not least, <laughs> it's the executive producer of the hit new Netflix Didn't series. Say my name. Darren Doctorman. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, we got to farm out these intros. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's the executive producer of, it says right there on the card, Darren, you should be watching the <laughs> video podcast on Electric Now. And then uh, last but not least, the executive producer of the hit new Netflix series, Dota Dragon's Blood. He was a writer producer for such shows as Fringe and Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles and Black Sails as well as the uh, writer of X-Men First Class, it is Mr. Ashley Edward Miller. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me. Wait a minute. I'm not a guest on this show. <laughs> I'm not thanking you for show. nothing, buddy. <laughs> but I know I am going to thank you for, for you, you got the title of my show right. And, and you were able to say Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles. Again. I worked on it all hiatus. I know. I, every time every you do day. it right, I just want to put, I just want to put like, you know, like a penny in your jar. I'm just. <laughs> penny in my jar. How nice. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm uh, of course, uh, and they're also the host of the wonderful new podcast on Electric Now and on the Electric Now app, Cartoon Barroom, where they talk about the latest in animation and cartoons. And it's really been great. I'm, I'm waiting for that retrospective on the heavy metal movie. Oh, Ooh. dude. Yeah, retrospectives are coming. Retrospectives okay. Are coming. That you know, I don't know. I you know, I'm the Pixar stuff's great and Disney, uh, but I want to hear the crazy stories about. Uh, and you got to get Ralph Bakshi. Oh my <laughs> God, man! You no, know, I want to hear about Fire and Ice. And that's like that's like not like the cartoon bar room. That's like the cartoon crack house. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> like, where's, the, where's the Fritz the Cat episode? Is what I mean. <laughs> right? I mean, look like the like just doing like a Bakshi episode would be. Yeah bananas we should totally do that yeah yeah but okay but the reason uh the reason we're here is, you know originally we record our our first episode of the fourth season and the news just broke literally before we hopped you know on the uh on the podcast that uh pacific theaters the owner of the arc light theaters is uh going i guess chapter 11 and that they've literally turned the keys over to their theaters including the historic cinerama dome to their landlord there is. This is obviously not a case of trying to get a concession out of their landlord. It's over as far as Pacific Theaters is concerned, and it is heartbreaking. It is absolutely heartbreaking. We we talked about the death of uh, of movies um, pre uh, previous episodes, but I think we were all very optimistic when this pandemic was over that they come it was back. Only theoretical. It was only theoretical, but now we're seeing perhaps you know we've suffered through a lot of great theaters closing in our lives. I mean, obviously those the small intimate theaters that we, theaters that we grew up on, there are now churches and other sundry places. And then of course, uh, the Ziegfeld in New York, the National in Westwood, uh, you know, a lot of really terrific, the Lowe's Astor Plaza, all gone. But I think this one hits, hits really hard. Tell me why, Steve. Well, first I'm gonna, I wanna pour one out using my new Pete pot whistle mug. <laughs> Can you show that? What does that say? Tea time. Tea time with, with, Pete, with, pot with Pete pot whistle. Uh, Pete pot whistle. Pete pot whistle will live on forever in the 430 movie. And uh, let's pour one out for the arc light. No, uh, the Cinerama Dome obviously has a very long and storied history in Hollywood uh, before it, it ever became part of the arc light chain. And uh, I believe at least the exterior of the building is a protected landmark but I think that doesn't mean they can't gut it and turn it into a restaurant or something, uh, which would be awful. But uh, I have faith that some other theater chain will step in because these arc light theaters have become such a part of the fabric of the Los Angeles movie going scene. Uh, when when they started, uh, they they created an environment uh, of uh, first class movie going with excellent. Uh, sound and projection, no commercials. Uh, they only showed two or three trailers. Three trailers, maximum with three maximum. trailers. Uh, yeah, no commercials. Uh, and they offered uh, high quality uh, snacks and supposedly a zero tolerance policy for talking and cell phones, although that was never really enforced, uh, at least not to my liking. But um, they really were, uh, the seats were comfortable. You could do reserve seating, which was kind of an innovation for the time. So you could book your seat in advance and not have to wait in line for an hour to, to get your primo center row, center seat. Um, and uh, it just offered, uh, it was very rev pioneering and revolutionary for that. And of course, of the movie. ushers, the ushers were name tags with their favorite movie. So you mm -hmm. say, oh, hey, Jen, I see you love Speed 2 also. No. <laughs> <laughs> I just I read mean, a story on Twitter by a, a woman who worked a, at, a, at, a, at an Arclight Hollywood, and her her favorite movie was, um, oh, uh, was, uh, uh, oh, I'm blanking on it. Uh, it was a Bogdanovich movie. Uh, Last Picture Show? No, the one before Cats that. Catch Meow? Oh, no. uh, Targets. 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 No. no. Oh, uh, uh, Oh, I'm blowing okay, the story. 
It was paper oh, before. Moon. Oh, paper that was moon. after. That was after. That was, after. was after. So, pay, anyway, her her it's movie cool was paper moon. targets. And there was a big there was a big line of people at the snack bar, and everything was crazy. And uh, the this the guy gets up to the front of the line, and and she sees him leaning in and reading her name tag. She's like, "Oh God, come on, let's let's hurry it along." And she's like, "Oh, Paper Moon. Do you know who directed that?" She said, "Yeah, Bogdanovich." She's like, "Very good." And uh, he walked away, and then she realized that that was in fact Peter Bogdanovich. The ascot gave it away. <laughs> uh, the, awesome. the arc light was famous for, uh, you know, attracting a clientele of cinephiles and professionals. Oh, it, it was very commonplace to see an actor or a director or producer at the arc oh, light. Wow. I saw them there all the time. Yeah, I uh, had to stop. I, so my my wife, God bless her, um, is she just doesn't have the ability to perceive celebrities as celebrities, like out in public. I can't and we either, were, by the way. And, and we were out at the arc light and we were up at the snack bar. We were just about to kind of get our stuff. And this woman comes up, like leans in and starts like blah, 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 blah about the uh about the her popcorn and like whatever the hell else it was that she wanted. And like I see my wife is like this. And she was about to say something, and I just kind of grabbed her and like the woman finished her thing. She ran off and and she goes, like, who does that bitch think she is? I said, that was Drew Barrymore. And she goes, Gertie, <laughs> <laughs> that's like, really Darren, Darren. Do you remember who we saw that time at the Sherman Oaks location? Oh well, yeah, absolutely. We saw fans of this podcast now. Yeah, yeah. Fans of this podcast now. Uh, but uh, we saw who someone who looked kind of like they were a homeless person standing in the middle of the uh, lobby at the ArcLight Sherman Oaks, and uh, then I suddenly recognized them and it took me a few minutes to uh process it in my mind um because it was timothy dalton and he was just sort of standing there looking around wearing shorts as i recall in this yeah. big empty lobby yeah and by himself he never uh, recovered from his defeat at the hands of the rocketeer there was there was no <laughs> cue there's no money penny plus plus his run-in with the boar worms <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> well, listen, I want to, before we talk about our memories, of, of which there's so many, You're talking about uh, I want to talk about the, <laughs> I want to talk about the history. Well, and that, that is part of it, of the, um, of this amazing uh, edifice. Uh, the Cinerama Dome uh, was, was, was built to accommodate Cinerama, which was right. uh, film's attempt to combat television by going as big as they possibly could. The Cinerama screen were three screens, so it would form a curved screen with three projectors projecting. This, this is Cinerama camera number one. On the back are three magazines, hold 35 millimeter film, a thousand uh, feet each. There's a single motor that drives a shutter that runs in front of three 27 millimeter lenses. The camera itself, unloaded weighs about 250 pounds. Then you put in the film, put the three car batteries that it takes to run the thing. If you're gonna shoot with sound, you need all the sound equipment and everything else. They're usually taking two to 3,000 pounds of equipment with them when they go to do a shot. Now, there are only three films that actually project an actual Cinerama at the Cinerama Dome. One of them was How the West Was Won. I think Ice Station Zebra was one, if I'm not mistaken. I believe Howard Hughes' favorite was. movie. And, 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 and do you know what the other one was? I don't, because I did was no it, research. Was it we, mad, it's a mad, 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 mad world? Oh, it might have been. It's a mad, mad, mad world. And then, of course, this is Cinerama. Was right. what, I, I saw that in Cinerama at Telluride. Steve, were you with me yeah. when you saw that? Yeah, that they, was amazing. They, they set up a Cinerama theater in, what was in that the, like? one of the venues. It was, it was extraordinary. Cool. <laughs> it was extraordinary. I mean, it was like seeing an IMAX. Uh, oh, wow. But uh, they also showed us what was the other famous cinerama film, Exotic Adventures, or it was like an mm. international travelogue. Because back then, people didn't travel around the world. And so the other big famous cinerama film, besides this is Cinerama, which took you around the world, was sort of this like exotic destinations. Again, uh, we didn't really do any research. This is all off the top of my head. Um, because we, we decided to do a show about five minutes ago. But um, <laughs> it, 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 it's a pretty extraordinary thing. But of course, the studios, it was very complicated because you had to keep the, the projectors all in sync. And so the Cinerama, 
actually, you know, didn't, and there weren't enough real films to do it with. So that they then went to the big giant one screen, one curved screen, which right, if you sat a, in the right place was amazing. If you sat <laughs> in the wrong place, it wasn't that great, yeah. but, um, but it was amazing. And so the, the, they showed the, the premieres of so many classics. Um, and then by the time it was going to be torn down, I think it was in the nineties. Uh, it was because it was all a parking lot. Uh, the Pacific Theaters bought it, and I think they spent like a year and a half, two years, and they added the arc light to it, and then kept the Cinerama Dome as the flagship. Of yeah, it used their to just theaters. be this the the geodesic dome in the middle of this vast Disneyland like parking lot, and they uh, they realized that they could get a lot more out of that prime real estate by building a whole entertainment complex with a parking structure. And as you said, Steve, the Arclight pioneered so many things like the reserved seating and it had the cafe there, you know, where you could eat. And then uh, later on, the Ami Amoeba Records opened next door. So you'd go, you'd eat, you'd get your your, your um, uh, tickets, you'd go down to Amoeba, you'd buy a bunch of laser discs. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, what, and <laughs> what most people don't realize is that for many, many years, uh, the Cinerama Dome was the absolute worst movie theater you could have for modern soundtracks because yeah. of its horrible i mean right behind the screen was basically a cinder block wall and uh it it could never be thx certified uh there was so many echoes and bad uh <laughs> and bad acoustics in the room that you were lucky to hear anything clearly in it mm. um it was only within the last 10 years that they did a refurbishment of it to bring it up to modern standards of presentation and be able to, you know, present these modern films with, you know, seven track Atmos and everything uh, correctly so that people could actually understand what was going on the screen. Um, but uh, I, I have to say that, you know, the original builders of the building itself were these giant 30 foot wasps. <laughs> that um, that did an amazing job on the on the structure itself, and the, the story the story of getting them out of there to be able to use it as a theater was uh, was one that I would like to see a movie of myself. Well, you know, the first time I ever saw the Cinerama Dome and I ever heard of it, ever knew anything about it, was in Galactica 1980 yeah. when it was destroyed by the Cylons oh, yeah. because you know it was footage from Earthquake. Mm -hmm. That they had repurposed, and in it, you know, Doctor Z says this is what could happen if the Cylons <laughs> found Earth. You know, which is like what <laughs> the biggest disappointment, like the history of television. It's like, wait, a second, they don't find Earth. This is a five-minute simulation from Cousin Oliver. Come on, that, and, that was the whole trailer. They were showing all that footage of yeah. the Cylons attacking Earth. Like, oh my God, I can't wait to see the show. And, and then they and pull then they the rug out from under you, like, oh. And they go, choo, 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 and the Cinerama Dome blows up, I think twice, because I think when they cut back to it later, it's fine. Like, this is how <laughs> the lack of attention to detail. They well, it rebuilt was, it. It was the wasps healing. that rebuilt it. Yeah, it was so healing exactly. So that was the first time I ever saw the Cinerama well, Dome. But go ahead, Ashley. I was just going to say, like, I think, like, in, in real terms, would we rather the Cinerama Dome close down or get destroyed by Cylons? I'd rather be destroyed by the Cylons. I got to agree. I, I got to agree. That would be it a seems lot like cooler. that's how it wants to go out, right? Now, the Dying thing besides is having so many of these amazing premieres throughout, you know, particularly, you know, if you look in the 50s and 60s, you through the 70s, and then later a lot of the studios did their premieres, but more often than that, they would maybe uh, do a premiere in the Cinerama Dome and overflow in some of the other theaters. Um, but uh, um, the, the revivals they would do there, like, I mm -hmm. remember seeing Close Encounters there, Blade Runner, Apocalypse Now. I mean, there was just some extraordinary – to have the chance to see these films on this immense screen. I think that uh, was the first place I saw the Blade Runner – it wasn't quite the director's cut, but it was when the, the work print – they showed the work print there. Uh, I saw it at the new art. After they showed it at the new art, they showed it at mm. the, the – they did a festival. They showed uh, Dr. Strangelove. They did this whole festival of great films there. And then they would do it a lot. Like I saw yeah. for the first time, I saw To Catch a Thief there. That was the first time I'd seen the movie. And, you know, Grace Kelly, 40 feet high. And I was like, oh, shit. Now I understand. You know, it's like you, when you see like some of these actors just as on these screens that are just so enormous, so much bigger than, um, than, than we, you know, what we 
generally get now, or at least what we had for a very long time, like on the four thirty movie. On the four thirty movie, you you understand like how how some of these people were stars, right? Like they had the faces first time, then. Yeah, like you could just <laughs> oh, like so much is happening, like even just little movements. Um, I remember I saw like I obviously it wasn't the first time I'd seen it, but I remember watching Top Gun. And, and under those circumstances and thinking, oh, that's why Tom Cruise became a star, right? Because there's just a thing that happens. Yeah. Some people, when they're 40 feet high, like they turn into XL the robot. Um, <laughs> when, they're, when, they're, <laughs> when they're 40 feet high, it's just like they have like, just something happens. They just have a charisma that you can't quite identify. This, that's not the same thing as just being attractive. It's, right. there's something else. But you know, there was a special thing about a night with your friends at the Arclight. I mean, I remember you talk about the celebrities, but Steve, and I think Darren, you were with us. Remember the time, I forget what we were seeing, but it was during the Writers Guild strike. And we, we would usually eat uh, before or after either at the, um, at the cafe there, which had great mozzarella sticks, or uh, <laughs> down the block at the Fabiola's Cafe or the Waffle. And um, so we ate there. And, and sure enough, there was, um, uh, was um, from the... Uh, the comedian, uh, the, the famous comedian, um, the funny guy. Oh clown. my god, I'm totally forgetting his name now. Who was the Drew Carey? Drew Carey. So oh. Drew Carey was sitting there having a meal, and we all looked at each other. And this is during the writers' strike. He he quietly had been paying for writers' um, meals um, yeah. at at Swingers, which yeah. he owned. And he said, any writer, anybody with a writers' guild card can eat there for free. Which you, and for year for a year, you know, it was it was quite a bit of money. And I knew writers who would just suddenly who would eat there every day. <laughs> I, I won't I won't say their names, but I thought it was really chintzy. <laughs> but like they would have lunch and dinner there, you know, because it's free. All right. <laughs> so um, we 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 basically you know all paid for his meal. We we told the waiter give us the check for Drew Carey and his friends, and we went and over and just said, look, we don't want to disturb you, but we just want to thank you. We're all WGA writers. And we want to thank you for what you've done for the guild and for writers in general. And he was really appreciative, and it was a wonderful memory. Um, but uh, we've had so many lovely uh, dinners at, at that cafe. That, you know, it, it was never particularly great, but they had good French fries. They had good mozzarella sticks. I think they had a good chicken sandwich, and it was convenient, and you could get booze. Yeah, yeah. they had a yeah. bar. The martinis <laughs> are amazing, or were. Yeah, 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 and. Um, and then they had a great gift shop too, mm. which was in, in later years it wasn't as great. But they used to carry all these film books yeah. and uh, uh, collectibles, and it was really fun because you could really make uh, you know you get there early because getting to Hollywood in the traffic was always a pain. Yeah, so you get mm. there early and you do a little shopping and you meet your friends to have drinks or or, or uh, food at the, at the at the place, and uh, and then you go see a movie. Well, and, and another thing the Arclight became famous for, and not just the Hollywood location, was uh, they would do displays of film costumes mm -hmm. in the lobby. And they had some amazing costumes for whatever the new release was just on display. And you could take pictures of them, and it was super cool. They made yeah. it feel special. Yeah. They made the, the cinematic experience what it should be, which is like rarefied. It wasn't like, oh, I'm watching this on my phone. It was like, yeah, there was the costume exhibit, and there was the giant clock, you know, that was uh, telling you it was the, ticking the, the down. The departure yeah. board. In the, mm -hmm. And let's not forget the uh, the introductions before the movies by the staff members who had to come out and, and introduce the film and with their little spiel. And well, some those. were very shy, and some were not. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> you some know, were actors. Yeah. Those, those displays in the in the lobby for all these uh, films. In the heart of Hollywood, the entertainment capital of the world, where they would show, you know, these big displays of costumes and things from all these movies that were shot somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love when the people, the you know, the the usher would 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 come out and say, "Hello, my name is so and so," and you know, today you're going to see a very special film, and you know, I've seen it and it's wonderful, and I'm like, I don't care. What are you, Siskel and Ebert? I mean, it was like, <laughs> you know, just say, "I let you come. This is the running time." And, uh, you know, thank you for coming. And if and you have a problem. Feel, uh, yeah, like, 
Uh, the running time is two hours and 20 minutes, so you might want to hit the bathroom now before it starts, you know, like, and if yeah, you have a problem, a, you'll find me or someone, someone dressed, dressed like, like, me. like me. Someone dressed like me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we, 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 want, we endeavor to present the best sound and picture presentation in all of Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> and, and but, but yeah, oh my God, when they start to get into, I've seen the movie and it's a real special film and the performance by Gene Hackman is pretty extraordinary. It's like, oh my God, stop. They're doing their own <laughs> podcast. Yeah, they're doing their own podcast. But, it, you know, the seats were super comfortable because the arc light was the benchmark. Now, you know, all the show, the things that came after, like the iPick and the AMC, like Dolby and all these, you know, um, sort of upscale theaters basically were knocking off the arc light. They didn't exist yeah. before the arc light. The arc light was, 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 was you know, set the standard. Yeah. And now some of these things we take for granted, like reserve seating and buying your tickets in advance. I mean, because when we first moved out to California, it was like Mr. Movie Phone. You would have to go, doo, doo, doo. The, the show is playing at four o'clock, five thirty. Da, da, da. Please press one if you'd like to order tickets. How many yeah, tickets you had to go like and order? stand in line? Press one. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I can't tell you how many times I, I usually get to a theater an hour early, and I'd always have at friends least. like, "Save me a seat. Just I have to hour? save like four or five yeah, yeah. seats." Yeah. For the worst. people. Yeah. I the arc like changed my entire relationship with going to the movies. I, yeah. The last movie that I went to see where I had to like stand in some goddamn line and save seats for people was, and, and this is what broke me of it, and you'll understand why when I say what the movie was, uh, was <laughs> Ong Lee's Hulk. And I realized that I'd been standing in line for two hours to save seats for eight people and that I was surrounded by assholes and it was really, really difficult. And I went, you know what? Fuck this. And then like I was done with the movie and I just said, I can't. I can't do it anymore. What is this arc light thing? Yeah. And after that, I wouldn't go to the movies anywhere where I could not reserve seats. Yeah. At all. Yeah. Oh, uh, they What's also, I think, were one of the first uh, theaters to really do the uh, stadium seating as a, as a regular right. thing. Mm -hmm. So you never had to worry about getting stuck behind, you know, a really tall person or someone like, you know, wearing a big hat. Mm -hmm. But I like to, um, <laughs> I liked also that you could just pick, you could pick the seats, yeah. which was so wonderful. Because I have certain, you know, I'm a little, you know, uh, high maintenance. And there's certain <laughs> mm -hmm. things that I, I, I like. And, I, you know, I'm a misogynist. Not a misogynist, misanthrope. <laughs> Sorry. I'm a misanthrope. I, I think yeah, correctly. Everybody. You and Pete no, no. Pottwistler are misogynist. I'm, I'm, I'm a misanthrope. So I don't like people around me. So you what I can do <laughs> is, is I could. I think I could, we have I like another t-shirt coming up. I like, I like, the, uh, I like the aisle seat. So I could not have anyone to the side of me, yeah. and uh, Jessica you know, von Puttermaker has opinions on this. And, I, 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 and you know, and then I could get seats for everyone else. Yeah. And you know, I, I you know, it's, it, but I, I, that was a terrific thing for me. That was a wonderful thing. And and, and you could even uh, you could even leave your tickets at the at the concierge mm -hmm. desk, so yeah, you would yep, so you could go sit down and you could pick yeah. up the, your friends could pick up their tickets at the desk. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it really, look, it was such a special experience. And I mean, especially, look, when we were all younger and going and to the movies together. <laughs> our hearts were, yeah, we're an open book. And uh, we would we would live and let live. I mean, we would, we would, we would, That's we what went we used there to say. a lot. We went there a lot. We went <laughs> there a lot. What does it matter to you? <laughs> <laughs> I just remember, I, I just remember going to those, uh, you know, uh, the, Special older movie screenings. Arclight like Presents. The, yeah. Yep, yep. And and seeing in 70 millimeter, Lawrence of Arabia. Ugh. I went one afternoon with some uh, some co-worker friends. And we sat in the, you know, the back third uh, in the in the raked seats. And up in front, two, two uh, rows in front of us, we realized are all the hobbits. <laughs> from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> it's, it's, and it turns out they're huge, and you can't. And they're putting Frodo their dirty feet Sam, up on the seat. Frodo back. and Samwise and and uh, Merry and Pippin are all sitting there watching Lord of the Rings with us. Fucking. And, I mean, uh, the, the Lawrence, Lawrence, of, Lawrence of Lawrence of the Rings. Um, <laughs> and and, and it was you, so then. surreal to be there in the midst of it, and it was such a you can't. You can't imagine that happening in real life. It, well, no, not only I don't that, believe that it did. Where would you see Lawrence of Arabia now? Like, exactly. what screen can hold it? 
You know, it's like, what screen is worthy of Lawrence Arabia? Look, I love the new Beverly. Love it. But, you know, it, it, it's not great for, like, something like Lawrence Arabia. No. It's great for sort of, you know, canon films. And like you know, stuff that was one three three at the time, and you know, yeah. you know, it's, it's not small. great for epics. It's too small, too small. right? Uh, the, and, and, and the Egyptian theater isn't bad for that. Yeah. The Egyptian they have, they is actually good. have seventy millimeter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, one of the great uh, screenings of the Egyptian was when I went to see the nitrate. You went with me, Steve. Yes, the nitrate print of Casablanca that Chris Nolan introduced. That oh. was an extraordinary evening. That was amazing. Um, and it looked beautiful on that screen. But well, speaking um, of hobbits, I, I think one of the, one of my last fond memories of the ArcLight was going to see the Lord of Link, Rings movies with Ashley and his and your mm. son. Yeah, who had not seen and his them before. Hobbit. Yeah, his little yeah. Hobbit. You know, and they were kind of doing the uh, the sort of the I don't know. I guess they were rerunning them, and it was his first experience being able to watch those movies. And um, and also, I got to show Caden for the very first time. He had never seen Raiders of the Lost Ark before. And he got to see it like on a real movie yeah. screen at the Arclight, which was yeah. amazing. Mm. You know, and, and the the only thing now that makes me just kind of go, uh, right, that I'm I'm trying to wipe from my brain because I don't want to remember it this way is I'm realizing the very last movie that I saw at the Arclight, I'm pretty sure, may God have mercy on my soul, oh God, was Birds of Prey. Oh, oh that's terrifying. Oh, oh. man. man. I, um, you know what? I'm going to pretend that's not true. I'm just going to pretend. It was Return you of the know, King, actually. It was Return of the King. Yeah. Yeah. You know yeah. what I love, too, about the art? Like, it would always, you would always run into people there. Yes. Because any, any like-minded individuals, like, you know, it, it, plus the dome would accommodate so many people. Like, if you're going opening weekend for a movie, you know, a big movie, like, you'd run into a bunch of people. Like, hey! The same, oh. the same people. Yeah, yeah, the same Always people. Always the same people. And, and, and at the ArcLight, too, you would run into all these people. And then also the ArcLight also, they did a lot of press screenings and they did a lot of theater mm -hmm. rentals. So I went, you know, to a lot of screenings there that, you know, uh, I, I, we even held some uh, uh, there. So oh, my I'm, God. Was, One of the greatest screenings I ever went to was the uh, anniversary, 30th anniversary of The Empire Strikes Back at mm. the Arclight Hollywood that uh, Harrison Ford was there, did a Q&A, oh and I was sitting front row center, and Harrison Ford was in his little director's chair about eight feet away from me, uh, telling stories about Empire Strikes Back. And there were several other people from the, from the production in the audience, and it was a, just a magical night. They did great Q&As there, too. They would bring yeah. out the director's chairs and have people, people come out and everything. Um, you know, it's funny, I'll tell you this story. I, I, the first time I ever saw 2000, this is an embarrassing story. First time I ever saw uh, 2001 was on the ABC Sunday Night Movie. I was watching it with my father, and I was so bored by all the the the, the, the Neanderthals throwing up the things. And I just, I'm like, I don't get it. I don't get why people love this movie. And uh, I I never watched it again. And then when I moved out here, 2001. This is long before the Nolan. Uh, you know, did what he did. This was a, a, a they re, re, you know they showed it at the cinema at the at the cinema Dome, two thousand one. This was in the nineties, and I went to see it, and that's where I fell in love with two thousand one. And it shows you the difference between the phone, you know, and, and and a real movie theater because that was where I learned to appreciate two thousand one. It became one of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah, I mean, the Cinematheque is a, an incredible resource for Los Angeles, both the Egyptian and the Arrow. Um, and they showed they did some um, incredible programming. But the Arclight would also do it on a regular basis with their Arclight Presents. And they showed just all kinds of movies from, uh, you, know, you know, classic films to comedies, to 80s movies, to action. I mean, it was they always had a great rotating program of classic movies that we could go and yeah. see on a big screen. Yeah, well, look, it's a tremendous loss to the LA film community, to cinephiles everywhere, to the business. And look, hopefully, hopefully, we've seen it before. The Cinematech was bought by Netflix. Other, you know, there are a lot of people out there with a lot of money. You know, the new Beverly was saved by Quentin Tarantino. Um, that hopefully, whether it's Amazon or Apple or somebody steps up or another theater chain and 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 saves the arc light because it's yeah. worth saving. Movies are worth saying. It's 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 an art form that uh uh, you know that the, the that pandemic is hopefully can't kill. American. Yes. Well, yes and no. We started it. We'll end it. Well, you could argue <laughs> the Nair brothers started it. But okay, that's a that's a conversation for another podcast. But I want to I, I want to welcome you back to the four thirty movie. If you're new to the four thirty movie, every week we curate a fantasy theme week. 
of classic films in the style of the old uh, 430 movie. Um, we'll be back with our first official show next week, which is um, going to be, it's an honor not to be nominated. <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll be picking films that were not nominated for Oscars, but should have. And each week we'll have all new, uh, all new shows. And of course you can listen to all three seasons of the fourth thing, wherever you listen to podcasts, or you can watch them on the free electric now app. And if you're a fan of this podcast, you can also check out Cartoon Barroom with Ashley and Steve or the Inglorious Trexperts with Darren and myself, where we talk about all things Star Trek. We just wrapped up a fantastic show with the great Ralph Winter, who had a, amazing stories about um, uh, the Star Trek films. I'm excited you know, about that one. Dropping. One day, I think our two podcasts are going to rumble. The yeah. Trek Trek <laughs> and the Barroom are going to have a rumble. It's coming. I can That's see right. It. And... Uh, if you don't like any of us, there's the best movies ever made, <laughs> which uh, doesn't have any of us on it. It's uh, Steve Scarlatta, the producer of Joe Rossi's Dune, and uh, Josh Miller, the writer of Sonic the Hedgehog. So if you're trying to avoid us, Same you're missing quality, like me, rapper. You, uh, <laughs> you may want to check out the, the best movies ever made, which is a terrific podcast as well. So uh, anyway, on behalf of uh, Darren, Steve, Ashley, and myself, we can't wait to see you on the fourth season of the 430 movie. Until then, Eyewitness News starts now. This show is produced by Dean Devlin and Mark A. Altman and is an Electric Surge Network production.